6. That's the number of players that were drafted before this guy that all but took the second half of the 2010s for himself. He mainly fell to 7th in the 2009 NBA draft because, to put it lightly, he was tiny. All of his life, from middle school to high school to college, and even for a bit while he was in the league, nobody believed a pure jump shot would be enough to take this tiny frame to the top of the league. Yet, through three titles that'll probably go on to be four in a few months, multiple MVPs that featured one that was unanimous, and a jump shot in the likes of which this world has never witnessed, teams look absolutely foolish for having passed on him so hard in the 09 draft. Ten years ago, the three-point shot just wasn't the move like it is right now. And just so you can see that in the numbers, the New York Knicks led the 2009 season and three-pointers attempted at 28 a game. Today, the Houston Rockets lead that stat at a whopping 45 a game, and if the Knicks played in today's NBA, they would rank at 26th. The point here is, if a team was looking for a point guard back then, they were more enthralled with a guy like Derrick Rose who was an ultra-athletic slasher that could finish as well as guys much bigger than him. And at that time, there was just nothing about Steph Curry that said he'd be an elite finisher at the professional level. Take a look at the report that was out on him in 09. The hilarious thing is, a ton of these so-called weaknesses became his strengths. His shot selection literally changed basketball, being stuck between a 1 and a 2 made him a perfect combo guard in which the warrior system now plays off of, and relying too heavily on the outside shot. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the point, Steph Curry was slept on, but both the Knicks and the Warriors were in love with him so he was going top 10 either way. They just had to get lucky enough for this gym to fall that far which they really didn't expect. And well, life just works in some mysterious ways. Or some teams make horrible life decisions, we'll get to that. Blake Griffin was taken by the Los Angeles Clippers at number 1 overall. He was an ultra-athletic forward out of Oklahoma and was easily one of the most exciting prospects going into that year. He'd already shown a high-flying tendency in college that suggested he'd be a star at the pro level, and the Clippers were desperate for anything remotely positive in their franchise after years of just existing. Thus, the number one choice. So in terms of the question, where is he now, well, he's actually balling out in Detroit where absolutely nobody's paying attention to him, hence why he's grown the Captain America refuge beard. He's just doing a good day's work in total silence. I mean, he made the all-star team, but he's definitely not getting the type of recognition and clout that I think he deserves. Obviously comparing careers, you can't say he was a better pick than Curry or anything, but he wasn't a mistake either. Through the adversity, Blake has managed to get better as his career progressed, and there were times in LA where he showed MVP potential. Through his years with the Clippers, he averaged 22 points and 9 rebounds with a peak in 2014 of 24 and 10. Of course, for a while his downfall was that of so many other ultra athletes which was injuries. He was constantly out for long stretches of time over those Clipper years which even cost them a few playoff series, in turn causing people to slowly fall asleep on him. However, after four consecutive years of missing the All-Star game, he made it back this season and is arguably having the best year of his career putting up 26 points, 8 rebounds and 5 assists while potentially leading the Detroit Pistons to only their second playoff appearance since 2009. The biggest addition to his game has been the 3 point shot, where he now takes 7 a game and shoots 37%. That's an amazing tool he's developed, as in his best season before this in 2014, he was shooting just 27% while barely shooting it at all. So you never hear much about Blake these days because he's not humiliating the Pau Gasols of the world consistently, and he's no longer creating dunks that are heard around the world. But he's clearly found redemption, at least for now. I'm sure LA would have liked to have had Curry considering how things turned out, but all things considered, Blake is not the worst guy to have picked before him, trust me. Plus, they had Baron Davis at the time, so a point guard really was not their focus. Oh, but that tune changes with the quickness. The second player selected before him was a name some of you may not have even heard by now, Hashim the Beat. Boy was the hype around him big in 2009. Big hype for a very big player. The Beat was a 7 foot 3 big man coming out of Connecticut averaging 14 points and 11 rebounds, but most importantly, an eye popping 4 blocks per game. That being said, he was selected more so based off of the defensive ability his 7 foot 6 wingspan would hypothetically allow, and what it had at least shown at the collegiate level. The other amazing feature of his defense was that while blocking so many shots, he wasn't really fouling either so it looked good when thinking about him as a prospect. Simply put, the Grizzlies goal was to take the best player available, and at the time with what was left on the board, they really thought they had. 
That approach made tons of sense for Memphis. If you look at their roster before they drafted him, they already had Rudy Gay, OJ Mayo, Mike Conley, and Mark Gasol. In that offseason, they would acquire big man Zach Randolph who'd make the all-star team, so they kind of already had their position set for the future. The team that went to the conference finals four years later was made up of that core, or most of it at least. That situation was not ideal for the beat's development, nor did it help that they didn't really get him any big man coaches to teach him the way around the league. At the time, the only mentor he would have had as a big man would have been Mark Gasol, and he wasn't even established yet, that was only like his second year in the NBA. Combine all this with the fact that at the NBA level, he wasn't prepared to deal with guys that were much bigger and faster than what he was dominating in college, and you've got the perfect ingredients for a bust. I actually compare this to what's going on in Orlando right now. While Nikola Vucevic isn't a superstar or anything, he's a great sensor. And the Magic took Mo Bamba anyways knowing development through minutes would be hard to come by in that situation. I fail to see how he's going to reach his potential in that situation. And the B actually pointed that out himself in a 2016 interview. He mentions how he didn't really know where to fit in with the Grizzlies or what he was actually going to do there, and that he hadn't even worked out for them. But the most important part was that he started playing basketball at the age of 15 in Tanzania. He pointed out that for so long, he was this 7 foot guy that towered over everyone so, as long as he was dunking the ball people were happy. Before he knew it, he was a college recruit, and then the number 2 pick while he was still trying to learn how to play the game. Meanwhile, many of his draft mates and tons of guys in the league had already been playing since they could walk, especially organized basketball, so he really was not set up for success in multiple areas. We've seen guys like Joel Embiid start playing basketball late in life and be successful, but that just doesn't work for everybody. The one gem that deserves to be pointed out though in his rookie year was that he blocked 1.3 shots a game while only playing 13 minutes. Adjust that for regular minutes and maybe he had some potential to develop into a rim protector, but that was not going to happen in Memphis. And it would have never been worth it in the future NBA to have a guy who could do literally nothing else on the court at a high level. So the beat wasn't a good professional player overall, and he wasn't drafted into a situation that nurtured his development. The result? He lasted just 5 NBA seasons, played on 4 teams, and finished with career averages of 2 points and 3 rebounds a game before being traded from the Thunder and waived by the 76ers. Today, believe it or not, the beat is still working on an NBA comeback as he says he's not ready to be a businessman, and he refuses to let the people down in Tanzania who see him like a hero figure. He's actually been working on a comeback now since 2016 with a trainer named Frank Matriciano. And as recently as two weeks ago during All-Star Weekend, he worked out with the Rockets, Raptors, and Pistons. At 32 years old, he faces the monumental challenge of erasing his bus label after being out of the league for five years. And for any kind of success, he will have definitely had to have refined his game since we last saw him. Traditional big men are nearly a thing of the past, so while I'm rooting for him, because the story I read was quite sad, if he can't pass, shoot, or something to fit into today's style of play as a 7 foot big man, it's gonna be really difficult. And as far as if the Grizzlies should be kicking themselves for selecting him over Curry, I mean, what were they gonna do with him on a roster with Conley and OJ Mayo already starting? Let's be thankful that didn't happen. Ankle injuries and a bench roll might have snuffed Curry out before he ever had a chance to shine. At the number 3 spot, we don't have to spend much time here. The Oklahoma City Thunder selected James Harden and they made a beautiful choice as he was 6 man of the year a few years later, helping along with KD and Westbrook to obtain an NBA Finals berth. Hell, for the first 3 or 4 years of their career, Harden probably looked like the better choice, as Curry was still navigating his way through seemingly never ending ankle ailments. Today, James Harden plays the role of what could easily be considered the most hated player in the league. 50 points and 10 assists, 30 point streak, laser guided step back 3 pointers, it's like nobody even cares what he does. The hate right now is at an all time high. That's fascinating too because people were up in arms when he didn't get the MVP over Westbrook in 2017, and now that he has one with somewhat of a chance to even repeat, the hate boners are just everywhere. Anyways, ironically, Harden also currently plays the role of what could be the biggest threat to Steph Curry's team. After two straight years of being eliminated by the Warriors, last year Harden twice came within like two quarters of sending that dynasty squad home. Some rather unfortunate events deterred that, but even with Curry's success, the point is, Harden being selected over him is nothing insane. Both teams who have had Harden have benefited greatly, and he's been on an insane run for the last 3 years where he's often in the conversation for being the best player in the league. There's even some people that would choose Harden over Curry today, 
and nah, I'm not one of those. Obviously, the Thunder had Westbrook and KD, so it made no sense, especially in 2009, who really was only gonna go as far as his shot could take him, or at least that's what it looked like. And when you think about them having the third pick, yeah, that just did not make sense for them. You can even see that there just wasn't enough basketball to go around for Harden to break out on that team. And I've never heard a Thunder fan say they wish they would have drafted Curry, so the context around their draft choice matters and it's not really an interesting what if. Our fourth pick was a tall point guard by the name of Tyreek Evans. And this is precisely where you start to see what teams were preferring in a guard in contrast to Curry. Standing at 6'6 six six and 200 plus pounds, and having come out of Memphis averaging 17 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals, he seemed to be strong in every area that Steph Curry wasn't. He was big, showed the potential to be very versatile, and especially would be expected to shine over Curry in defensive ability. The Kings were the first team in the draft that truly needed to be looking in the direction of a franchise point guard, and this is who they chose. And what's more, Sacramento actually looked like they chose him right. Evans went on to secure Rookie of the Year while averaging 20 points, 2 steals, 6 assists, and 5 rebounds. Just to put that into perspective, that rookie stat line was nearly identical to what LeBron James accomplished in his first year. But that's literally as good as it got for him. In his three remaining seasons with the Kings, his stats went down every single year in almost every major category. It was as if his expected progression literally went in the opposite direction. Since then, he's played for the Pelicans, went back to the Kings briefly, Memphis, and he currently plays with the Pacers. In a career that looked more than promising nearly a decade ago, he's proven to just be a decent role player, never making an all-star team or really doing anything else significant that he was expected to. And as usual, yes, the Kings ate shit on this one. Unlike the other teams, they really did need a point guard for the future. And unlike Evans, Curry's progression went in the right direction. Today, the Kings are still hunting for their first playoff berth since 2006. And if they had a managed Curry right, I highly doubt this decade of suffering would have ensued. And now we have reached the point where things get really, really bad. While the Timberwolves have clearly had an eye for great big men over the years, they really could have used that second eye for a future MVP point guard in 2009. They had both the 5th and the 6th picks in the draft because right before it, they traded Mike Miller and Randy Foy to the Wizards for the 5th pick to pair with the 6th. Wow, the Wizards, man. <laughs> wow, what a move. Anyways, at this point, Minnesota was two years removed from having traded Kevin Garnett, and were already off to a decent start with a potential corner piece in Kevin Love. However, they had nothing resembling a star point guard, so the goal was clear here, and oh boy did they miss the mark. The worst part about the decision to draft two point guards back to back not named Steph Curry, was drafting two point guards at all. David Kahn, who was president for the Wolves, said that he saw Johnny Flynn and Ricky Rubio as the next Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe, that is what he was envisioning. So he apparently thought he was going to have a successful team with two small guards in the backcourt, and one of them was not even going to be in the NBA for a couple of seasons after he was drafted. First, they picked up Ricky Rubio, and I'm gonna elaborate on that soon because this actually was not a horrible idea. But on their second try, they really struck out by choosing Johnny Flynn for all the wrong reasons. While Flynn was even smaller than Curry, he was like a pack of dynamite considering how athletic he was for his size, and like I said, that drew more attention than anything in 2009. So for Ricky Rubio, considering where he is now, we can actually say this was a decent selection. Rubio did not play for the Wolves until the 2012 season due to him staying in Europe for two more years, but when he did arrive, his ability was clear. He initially averaged 11 points, 8 assists, and 2 steals where he demonstrated that while he did need development, he might have been what they were looking for. But that's the part that people forget when they're criticizing Kevin Love to make it seem like he wasn't that great due to a lack of team success. They forget that the Wolves were turning a corner with Rubio at the helms before he devastatingly tore his ACL in his rookie year. At that point, Minnesota was 21-19, which isn't much, but it was over 500 and it was competitive enough for playoff contention which was a far cry from anything that had happened since 2004 in that franchise. Rubio played there for 5 more seasons where he stayed about the same, but obviously after they traded Kevin Love, it was time to rebuild again and Rubio is not the guy that's gonna lead a rebuild. Today he plays for the Jazz and uh, yeah he's good. He's a far cry from Curry, he never even got close to that, but he's no slouch. But as for our friend Johnny Flynn, that's where things got really bad. They had a choice to make between a small point guard that could shoot, and a small point guard that was super athletic. 
They chose the latter and it cost them. Thing is, he got the chance to prove himself for the years before Rubio left Europe, and he actually had a decent rookie campaign, averaging 14 points and 5 assists. Nothing amazing at all, but he didn't have bust written on his forehead just yet. Actually, you might say like Greg Oden. It was an injury that took him out. Flynn suffered a hip injury shortly before the start of the 2011 season, and he barely played or started any games after that. His stats dropped tremendously, and he was never even close to being the same. So the argument will then become, was he actually going to be a good player, or was he just scoring inefficiently on a bad team during his rookie year? Nobody knows, but I feel confident that he was never going to be close to Steph Curry. The information about his style from his rookie season doesn't sound encouraging either if we're trying to make that argument. He played just four seasons in the league after spending time in Houston and Portland, and we have not seen him since 2012 after a few summer league stints. Information on Flynn's whereabouts today is very scarce. He played in the NBL, the CBA where he left after a month due to injury, and Europe where he again left after two games due to injury. From what I can find and confirm, it really sounds like he just doesn't want to be found. These guys all had pride and ego once, so who would want to be in the public eye after being labeled a bust and now officially being known as the guy that was drafted before Steph Curry? I get it. So after all that, Curry fell to the Golden State Warriors which was a dream scenario for the franchise as they were one of the few to believe so heavily in him. They actually had a deal in place to trade the 7th pick for Amari Stoudemire before it was apparent that Curry would be available. Curry himself did not want to play for the Warriors, he won in New York. That could have gone really good or really bad. As a matter of fact, it doesn't seem like he wanted to play anywhere except New York, so it wasn't just Golden State he wasn't interested in. A star as big as Steph playing for the Knicks might have made the universe collapse in on itself from the amount of hype and clout, I don't know. But nevertheless, Steph went on to change the game of basketball, and 10 years later, there are only two players the teams can even feel good about having drafted before him. In any case, those were the six players drafted before Steph Curry, and that's where they are now, except Johnny Flynn. We'd love to hear from you, man. 